Eric Schulman is a, a, a longtime veteran in the Sandler system. He's at, he, he actually uh, is an entrepreneur playing many roles. And uh, before he did this, he was actually a management consultant for a company that did um, deep dive diagnostics for small, mid-sized businesses all across the country. So here, here's a guy who's got uh, an unlimited amount of energy uh, for his age. And I just want to welcome Mr. Eric Schulman. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how to take that for my age. Um, I do want to thank you. The fact that you slimmed down the picture, I think I've lost about 10 pounds. Um, do me a favor. In the books is the slideshow. Close your books. And let's do this without the books, because you'll get a lot more out of it if you're not looking at the answers before, before you have them. Um, John said something really interesting about uh, getting rid of clutter. I want to pick up on that before I jump into my program. About once every month or so, I do what I call a desk enema. I take everything on my desk, all the little bits of paper, all the stuff you've pushed aside, I put it into one pile, I take it into my training center, and I literally sit there with a trash can, a bunch of file folders, and three baskets. And I go through it, half of the stuff on my desk disappears instantly. Um, there's an old management system that I use called Drop, Delay, Delegate, Do. It's called the four Ds. When you pick a piece of paper up, could you just throw it away? That's the best option. You never have to touch it again. If you can't drop it, can you delay it? If it doesn't need to get done today, let's put it in for next Tuesday, but then you'll do it on Tuesday. If you can't drop it or delay it, you delegate it to someone else. Brian, would you get this done for me? Yes, sir. See how easy that was? It's off my desk. And the last one is do it. If you can't drop it, if you can't delay it, if you can't delegate it, what you wind up with is a small pile of immediate dues. Uh, you wind up with a, a pile of stuff that you're going to put off, and the rest is delegated or off your desk. And it's amazing. You come in. You know what the most productive day in business is? Day before vacation. Day before vacation, exactly. And he goes on a lot of vacation, so he knows that. <laughs> you get a lot more done the day before vacation. So let's jump into this. It's a little story about this talk. About 12, 13, 14 years ago, when I first got into the Sandler business, I'm a Sandler veteran, been using it since 83. I've built and sold two businesses and then led the sales force at the management company. And when they decided they were going to limit my income, I said, screw this, and I bought a Sandler franchise. Opened April Fool's Day would be my 16th anniversary in the business. Um, and a chamber asked me to do a talk, and I'm trying to come up with an interesting name. And I said, what about 13 and a half things you won't do to build your business? They said, what's the half? I said, you'll need to come to the talk. And we put it on the calendar, forgot about it. And then the day before the talk, I get the note, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. I said, holy crap, i got to come up with the talk. So I came up with the talk. I've been doing this talk now for about 14 or 15 years. I've modified it and changed a few of the things, but it will ring true. First thing. You're not doing enough cold calling. Now, I know a lot of you are owners and you don't think you're in sales, but you've got to make cold calls. Your people will do what you do. I always say people will duplicate 50% of what you do right and 150% of what you do wrong. Your people are looking at you. You're the leader. So what holds us back? And by I, I am interactive. When I ask a question, I'll wait for answers. What holds us back from making cold calls? Fear. Fear. What are we afraid of? Rejection, okay? At the count of three, as loud and as nasty as you can, I want you to yell the word no at me. I want the people in the hallway to wonder what's going on. You guys ready? One, two, three! No! Any blood? Am I okay? <laughs> Your mom conditioned you to hate the word no, which is why we don't like the word no. All of this is programming. You'll find other things to do. You'd rather clean the litter box, put you know, files in the paper, you know, visit around the office than make the cold calls. I call it creative avoidance. Filing. You, you find busy stuff to do. I've got to do these proposals. By the way, that's the excuse salesmen use. Look, guys, I can't make my cold calls this week. I've got these big proposal I'm working on. We'll get to that later. You're reorganizing. There's something called pay time and no pay time. From 8 to 5, you do the skills that will make you money. From 5 to 8, you do the other stuff. 
Come in at 6.30 in the morning. You'll get more done in the first two. You get all the filing, get all the stuff off your desk, and you'll have 19 voicemails out. Call people before they get in. Call at 7 in the morning, and you'll get voicemail. And you can avoid the gatekeeper, right? Call at 8 o'clock at night. If you catch a CEO working at the office at 7 or 8 o'clock at night, he or she has problems, and it might be something that you can fix. You're, you're doing, we, we default to email, and please, the younger people, don't take this wrong, but you guys don't know how to connect the people. You're wrapped up in, in, in the devices. And we older people got sucked right into it also. But people will hide behind email. Stop making excuses. Make one call a day. Is there anybody in here that doesn't have time to make one prospecting call a day? Nobody raised their hands. Do the math. One call a day is five a week. It's 20 a month. It's about 250 a year. If you made 250 phone calls, I, I, we haven't met, right, Denise? If you, and you're not a salesperson, right? But if you made 250 phone calls to potential clients, how many conversations do you think you'd have out of 250 calls over the course of a year? 200. And out of 200, that's actually a high number, out of 200 conversations, how many might be interested in the product that you sell? About 150. And if you or your sales team went out and started and, and had those 150 meetings, what's an average client worth to you? Pardon me? What's, it worth? what's an average client spend with you? What's a client worth to you? A thousand bucks, ten thousand bucks, a hundred thousand. I don't know your business. What does an average client spend with you in a year? Uh, about ten thousand dollars. Out of 150 meetings, how many of those clients do you think you'd get? Be conservative. About thirty. About thirty. So you just did three hundred thousand dollars a year in additional business because you made how, how many more calls? Two. One call. What if you made two calls a day, guys? Stop making excuses. Make the calls. Thing number two. You're not going to enough networking meetings. Now, a lot of us are CEOs. We own businesses. And myself included, I'm guilty. How many of us have blown off a networking meeting that we know we should have gone to in the last six months? Yeah, you didn't go to the trade show. You didn't go to the conference. You said, you know, that evening thing's a little late today. I don't really feel like getting up at 7 AM to be at Valencia at 8 AM for this damn thing, right? You got to show up. 90% of success in life is showing up. You think they're a waste of time. You know why they're a waste of time? Any fishermen in here? OK, uh, Brian, what do you like the fish for? Uh, freshwater, bass. Good. Pike. Will you find them over in the ocean? No, sir. Wrong pond, right? Yes. What are you fishing for? Where do those fish live? That's where you need to fish. I do a lot of work with CEOs and leaders and high-end salespeople and sales managers. So I want to be in a room like this that has people that are fish that I'm fishing for. I don't want to go to a BNI meeting, which is mostly broke salespeople, right? All trying to sell each other something. I want to be able to talk to people that are at the same level that I'm at. Belonging to a country club, going to the citrus club, serving on a nonprofit board. These are where you're going to meet those kind of people. And the other thing is you're going to get leads. I go to a networking meeting to give leads and to make connections for other people. Occasionally, it happens for me. But I go to try and give two referrals every day. Give away two pieces of business. Connect Ray to, to Ray over here, because they should know each other, right? You, already, you guys already do know each other. But connecting people, that's what networking meetings are about. Most networking meetings, you're not networking, you're not working. Who's your ideal prospect? And again, if you're hunting for antelope, you're not going to find them in Kansas. You might want to go to a different continent. Okay? So network meetings are good, but you've got to go where the people that you need are. I'm going to go through this because we're a little behind on time. Strategic alliances. Who gets business when you get business? And who benefits when you, when you sell somebody? Um, a client of mine is in the IT world. He put together a little once a week group. It's got himself, and he does IT managed services. It has a commercial real estate agent. It has a guy in the phone business, has a copier machine person, a printer, because when a business moves, they need a mover. When a business moves, they need all of those services in the next two to three months, right? 
Do you build strategic alliances that make sense for you? And do you hang out with those people? And are you a resource for them? When they get busy, you get busy. And this is the that's one I just told you about. I actually didn't know that was up there. Thing number four. You're not using a selling system. You all use a bookkeeping system in your business? Do you have a, an order processing system? Anybody in manufacturing, is there a manufacturing process they need to follow? What's your sales system? I don't care whether you use mine or somebody else's, but if you don't have a systematic process to address this part of your business, what are the three key things? You got production, finance, and sales. And nothing happens till somebody sells something. How do people get into sales? It's an accidental profession. How many of you in here have a college degree? Show of hands. How many of you have a degree in sales? Interesting, nobody's hands up. You know how I get in sales? You're, er, er, I'm Eric also. One day somebody will say to you, you know what, you're good with people, you should be in our sales department. And you're gonna be my age and still be in sales. You're good with people, you should be in sales. You have to have a systematic process. Why? If you have a system that is successful, you can duplicate it, okay? If you, you can see what people are doing right and what people are doing wrong. If you and I follow the same system, any, anybody golfers in here? Right, there's a system to teaching a golf swing, right? You've got the grip and the stance, and please don't critique mine, right? Then you've got position one, position two, position three, position four, right? And there's a breakdown of the set, and you set up a certain way, and the club head has to be, and there's a process they teach you. There's interlocking grip, there's overlapping grip, and whatever system you use, and there's a pre-shot routine, when it comes to sales, it's the hail fellow well met, right? Let's have a conversation. Let me tell you why my stuff is good. You wing it, right? We, we read a book. Guys, I read the Ben Hogan book on golf. I still can't break 80. I rarely break 90 anymore, right? I read the Kama Sutra. I still don't understand women. You ladies do not work like it's said in the book. <laughs> You need a system or you will default and the buyer will control the sales process, which is another, another class. Thing number five, you're not talking to the real decision makers. You're talking to people who've requested the quote, Vito. Anybody read the book Selling to Vito? Now, Vito stands for very important top officer. It's not a guy in New York. A couple of years ago, uh, Dave Matson, our CEO, and Tony Paranello, who wrote Selling to Vito, wrote a book together called Five Minutes with Vito. What do you do in the first five minutes with this top executive, this C-suite person? Okay? You're with Seymour. Seymour is Vito's assistant. Seymour's job is to see more salespeople, see more quotes, see more information. Seymour is allowed to say no, but he's never allowed to say what? Yes. yes. You can't get a, you can't, you can't get a, 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 don't take a no from someone who can't say yes. And will they lie to you? Are you, by the way, ladies, never ask a man, are you the decision maker? What will they say? Yes. Oh yes, me big decision maker. <laughs> me the decision maker. Follow it up with this, lie to me. Are you the decision maker? Uh, yeah. All by yourself? All by myself. So there's no one in here you'd have to even check with before you actually wrote the check? Correct. The hesitation, the little looks in his face. You gotta learn this stuff, guys. You gotta learn how to read people's faces. In sales, you're not paid to convince people. You're paid to read the situation and respond accordingly. The reason you're not talking to decision makers, it's your mom's fault. You can't talk to him. He'll never take your call. She makes more money in a week than you make in a year. And all these little voices inside our heads tell us this stuff. How many of you talk to yourself during the day, by the way? Okay. The ones who didn't raise their hands, the little voice that says, do I do that? No, I don't. Do that. That's the voice <laughs> I'm talking about. You have to understand where the voices come from. Your mom programmed you. You have to understand transactional analysis, parent, adult, child, ego states, and how they play into our buying decisions. Do you realize that your six year, we all have a six year old on the inside? would rather go play today, right, than to be here or to be at work. You know, my six-year-old bought the Harley back in 2005. My mom says, you don't need it, you're 50. I says, you're right. But my six-year-old said, oh, the one that looks like a 57 Chevy is so cool. 
and 25 grand later, I had a Harley. Your mom programmed you. You've got to understand this if you're going to be communicating with people. Forget about sales, because this is about communication. Number six, you're not finding what their real problem in the sandler world, we call it pain is. We're selling to symptoms. I think I need a new phone system. Well, let me tell you why well, my phone system is great. You know, I'm not happy with my IT guy. Let me tell you how good we are. You know, my current catering, ah, we can knock the socks off you. That's not, you're treating the symptom, not the pain. Salespeople present, we call it PPS, premature presentation syndrome. You show up and throw up. You think that when you're presenting, or your salespeople think when they're presenting, they're actually selling. Most of the time, they're doing free consulting. Because when I give you a quote, what are you going to do with my quote? Look at, Look at the number, and then what are you going to do with it? Take it to your existing guy. Hey, can you beat this? <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks, you saved me 10 grand. <laughs> they never even call you back and thank you for that. <laughs> Selling features, advantages, and benefits. People do not buy features, advantages, and benefits. They buy one for one reason. Can you make it stop hurting? No pain, no sale. You don't understand the concept of pain. By the way, you didn't cause their pain. You're the one who might be able to fix their pain, but you got to get them to tell you about it. It's like John was talking about going for therapy. My wife says some of the best hours in her life have been spent with a therapist. This was before she met me. She had a very nice therapist, and, and she was very close with her and helped her through a lot of different stuff. Find their real pain, not their pain indicator. Here's the rules on pain. Everybody has pain. The first pain indicator is they took a meeting with you. Something had to hurt, right? Second rule, everybody wants to get out of pain. The third rule is the one that gets you. Nobody wants to admit they have pain. You have to know how to create a safe enough place, just like the therapist, where they can talk to you and you become their business therapist. And then they convince you that they need what you have. That's a lot easier than you trying to convince them. Why would they want to buy and why do they want to buy it now? This was for another group. Um, oh, you're not doing your behaviors. How many of you still have some active role in sales in your company? You're still out there touching clients and such, okay? If you took a look at your sales activities during the last 30 days, let's say your first name is? Demo. Demo. You have a sales guy named Demo, okay? <coughs> He works for you, and the calendar that you've been following is actually his calendar. If you looked at that calendar for the last 30 days in terms of what you've done in sales to help build the company, would you say, good job, and give Demo a raise? Would you say, we're going to write you up and you've got to get better? Or would you just fire your ass and find somebody who would do the job? In most cases, it's the third option. If we did all the things we were capable of doing, we would literally astonish ourselves. There's another quote that goes along with this. You'll love this one. There but for me go I. You know what hell is? Hell is dying and meeting the person you could have been. Ooh, there's a chill, right? Sales behaviors, prospecting, cold calling, following up, having lunch with clients, building relationships. John talked about building the relationship with the bank. In banks, they have a magic number. You know what the number is? 4.6. If they have an average of 4.6 relationships with you, it is very unlikely you, you will ever leave that bank. If you just have a checking account or just have a car loan, you can be gone tomorrow, right? But if you've got a savings account, a safety deposit box, a checking account, a credit card, a second mortgage on the house, they've got to do something really horrible to get you to leave because you've got to move nine different things, right? How many relationships and how many things is your current client dependent on you for? If it's one thing, they could be gone tomorrow. If you're doing cross-selling and upselling, again, another class, they are tied to you. Thing number eight, you don't challenge your prospects enough. Our job is to challenge prospects in a call. Our job is not to kowtow to them. You know, what are you here to sell me? It doesn't sound like I'm here to sell you anything. Can I ask you one question before I go? Why would you invite me in? What were you hoping I could have fixed? Just so I have something to think about on the way home. Well, we're having challenges with our sales team. But, but you really don't want to fix that this year, do you? Well, yes, we do. No, you don't. <laughs> yes, we do. Well, if you wanted to fix it, you'd have me stay. Should I stay or should I go? All right, sit down.
you got to be the therapist, and you got to be a tough therapist. Sales is not a game for wimps. People wimp out. If you need to be liked, you shouldn't be in sales. Being likable is fine, but needing to be liked is like seventh grade. God, I hope they like me when I show up, right? Your job is to ask tough questions in a gentle fashion. I call it the velvet hammer. Who in here has a group of salespeople who work for them? Your name, sir? I'm Javed. I'm Javed. Uh, Javed, Javed, can I ask you one question, owner to owner? You can ask two. <laughs> what did your worst salesperson cost you last year in what they didn't produce? I mean, I don't have that case. They're all overproducing then. And they, so, Otherwise, they have not worked for my organization. Excellent. How would you do that? And now we're going to do something called a gained funnel. I'm going to let him tell me how he did it. I may learn something from him. But what's interesting is when people tell you what they're doing right, eventually something that's not running as well as that will come up. The object in a sales conversation is to keep people talking. And by the way, that's that, the, 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 the response. Um, uh, congratulations for what you're doing. Response I normally get from people is, oh, God, I don't want to think about it. Well, if somebody made you think about it, what would the number be? 10 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand? Next follow-up question is, but you've only got one bad one, right? No, I got three. And that's where my conversation with somebody starts. But that's a tough question to ask. Your job in a sales call is to ruin their day. They were doing fine. When I was in the management consulting business, I would walk into somebody, and they were expecting Janet, who sounded sexy on the phone. I'm not sexy. My wife tells me I'm sexy, but I have to pay her extra later today for that, right? It's Valentine's Day. Um, you know, I'm sorry Janet couldn't be here. Would it be okay if I filled in? They'd look at their watch and go, yeah, I guess so. Come on in. A lot of bonding going on. My job was to then get that person who thought his or her business was running fine, 5, 10, 20, $100 million business, to start telling me all the things about the underbelly of that business. Problems in finance, no exit strategy, cash flow issues, too much concentrated in one client, production and wastage, and all the things in their business that they never want to look at. And then to get them to commit to fixing it. People buy for their reasons, not ours. Will they like you? Do you want them to like you? Um, I, I, I enjoy it when people like me, but I don't care if you like me. I had a client, $100 million company. In fact, Steve just retired. Um, and I was talking back and forth. I had 40 of his people in the room, and I'm arguing back and forth with Mike about this need to be liked. He says, Eric, you don't understand our business. We call on the same people year after year after year, and they've got to like us, or they'll never do business with us. I says, Mike, it's okay if they like you, but you can't need them to like you. And Steve stands up. He says, can I say something? I said, sure, Steve, you're paying for this. Why not? He said, when I first met Eric, I didn't like him. He came into my office. He asked me really, really tough questions. Every time I tried to avoid an answer, he made me circle back and answer it. He made me admit things that I didn't want to admit to somebody I had just met. It was very, very uncomfortable. But I realized at the end of that meeting that I needed, my team needed what he had. He says, now, we've been, he's been working with our customer service people for the last year. They had seven people. These people have done $200,000 in add-on sales the previous year. He says, they went from 200000 to $2.3 in one year. I'm starting to like Eric a whole lot. <laughs> but you guys know I love to play golf, and Eric's never invited me to play golf. And I said, Steve, I didn't know you played golf. He said, yeah. So it's interesting. He's retired. We still play three, four times a year. That has nothing to do with how I needed to be in the meeting with him. If I needed him to like me, I wouldn't have asked the tough questions. If I didn't ask the tough questions, and that client has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars with me over the last 10 years, and I'm now working in four or five different divisions of this international company as a result of that. Thing number nine, you're still responding to RFPs and RFQs. Send us a quote, send us a proposal. We're getting three bids. Why are you doing that? Anybody know? Why, why are you, why, when you get a request for a bid, why do you, send it, why do you have your people do it? Easy. Hope. Hope. You're smoking hopium. <laughs> Hopium is addictive, by the way. We call this bid, quote, and hope. I, I can't make my cold calls. Got this big proposal I got to write. It's going to take me at least three days, right? And they put all the time and effort into it. They send it off, right? And then they sit and pray to the phone. God, I hope it rings. 
um, it looked like an opportunity. And they said, you know, we really are leaning in your direction and you get happy ears. I didn't bring them with me. I have a pair of rabbit ears with dollar signs on them that I'll put on. You can buy them at Spencer's Gifts. Keep them. If you have salespeople, when somebody comes in with an opportunity that really isn't an opportunity, hand them the happy ears. You've got to wear these the rest of the day. <laughs> what are the chances of actually closing it? Are you a good fit for the, for the, for the uh, thing? Your job is not to answer RFPs. Your job is to qualify or disqualify it before you ever pick up a pen. I'll give you something I give my students. Call them up and say, look, I got your RFP here. I, I, I think we're going to be a good fit for you. Here's the, write this down. When can we schedule the pre-bid meeting? They go, oh, that's a Scooby-Doo moment for them. Nobody ever calls. When can we schedule the pre-bid meeting? Well, what do you mean? Well, it's customary. We always do it just to make sure we're a good fit. Look, we don't want to waste your time. I'm sure you want to waste ours. If it's not a fit, in 10 or 15 minutes, we'll figure that out, and I'll get out of your hair. As a matter of fact, if I'm not going to be a fit, I'd be happy to look at the other vendors and tell you who I think would be best for you. Would that be any help? Uh-huh. And you get invited in. Sandler rule, when all else fails, become a consultant. If it's not going to be me, we'll throw my proposal away and I'll help you choose which of the other two makes sense. Your job is not to sell. Your job is to qualify or disqualify. And you give away too much free consulting. Think about the hours that you've spent doing that that never turned into business. Number nine, you're still taking think it overs. I'll make this one quick. My 25th anniversary is April 10th. Um, there is a Hebrew word called beshert. Beshert means destined to be together. It means soulmate. It, you know, it means literally, my, my wife's maiden name is Shulman, the same as mine. Spells it the same way too, S-H. Her dad was Herbert, was Stanley Leonard Shulman. My dad was Herbert Leonard Shulman. We're Jewish rednecks is what I tell everyone. If I go home tonight, even though it's Valentine's Day, I said, honey, how about tonight? She says, let me think it over. Ladies, what does that mean at home? Ladies? <laughs> means no, doesn't it? I know it means no. What do you think when a prospect tells you they're going to think it over? What does it mean 93% of the time? But here's the, sal the sad part. You will spend 50 to 60% of your life in sales doing what you call follow-up. You have a better chance of selling a cold call in a lot of times than you do on the 17th phone call or the 23rd email or the third drive-by on your follow-ups. The problem is, is we get emotionally invested and we're time invested in the client and we won't let go. No is the second best answer I can get on a sales call. Yes is the answer you all want. Think it overs are the ones that are killing you. Number 11, you're not leaving your six-year-old in the car. Now I get a lot of flack about this. Let me explain it. Remember we talked about the natural child, the six-year-old we all have on the inside? Your six-year-old is where all your emotion lies. If I'm emotionally involved in a sales process, can I ask the tough questions? My six-year-old is the one that wants to be liked. So you have to leave your six-year-old in the car. In other words, you can't take anything personal that happens on a sales call. I don't get emotionally involved in the win or the loss. In fact, sometimes I take people to know. I just figured out, I really don't think what you're looking for is what I've got. And they'll look at me going, I was sort of thinking the same thing, but I never thought I'd hear that from you. I said, look, your job is to be disarmingly honest on a sales call with people. If, they're not, if you're not a good fit for them, tell them that and point them in a better direction. And they may discover that you are a good fit. Sometimes they'll fight to keep you in the room. I'll let them win. Do sales, do, do your prospects ever lie to you? No. <laughs> Can I say, call bullshit on you? How do you tell if a prospect is lying? Lips are Thank you, that's exactly right. <laughs> all prospects lie all the time. They think it's okay to lie to salespeople. And if I'm emotionally involved and if I call, try to call them on the lie, I get my emotional needs met, but the whole thing. Do you get pissed off when they lie to you? You can't get emotionally involved. You have to give them an easy way to get out of it to keep the conversation going. It's only business, guys. You know, you can write more business. You can always, always, always write more business. There's more out there. Number 12, you don't use a coach. What do, what do these athletes have in common? Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, Peyton Manning. I should put, uh, what's his name? We just won the Super Bowl again. Brady. Brady. Um, you know, I'm a big sports guy, right? Um, 
at the top of their career, at the bottom of their career. Tom Brady's, what, 41 years old? So two years ago, he stopped using coaches and trainers, right? Because he's that good. Did he? Why didn't he? Because the best are always trying to get a little bit better and keep that edge. You need a coach in business. Your people in sales need a coach. Everybody needs a coach. I have a coach. I've got a guy I call every Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m. From 6.30 to 7 a.m., Kevin and I are on the phone. He's another Sandler trainer up in New Jersey. Happens to have the same last name as me, Shulman. We're not related. We looked into that, too. My wife and I are not related, either. We looked into that. Um, and we challenge each other. Why are you doing this? How come you're not doing this? He says, I'm a little bit down. I haven't been doing my behaviors. All right, what have you been doing? And he made some commitments to me that what he would be doing, and he's now going to do it. I need a coach, guys. I'm very good at what I do. I'm probably one of the best salespeople you'll ever meet. I'm a damn good sales trainer, too, but I use a coach. So who's coaching you? Whether you're using Vistage or, 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 or CEO Nexus or, or whether you're using an individual coach, but you need somebody that you're accountable to. If you're not accountable, you're not going to make changes. Number 13, still talking to non-decision makers. Why? They're easier to get to. Some of you are presenting or you're doing your 30-second commercial to the gatekeeper. Gatekeeper is a decision maker. He or she decides whether or not you get through. But people treat them like somebody they just want to step over, right? Treat the gatekeeper like a decision maker. Go a little bit helpless. Listen, I'm not sure if you can help me or if this is even the right place to call. You guys don't have a sales department in this company, do you? And they say what? Yes or no. And the person in charge of that would be? Whatever the name is. But he's not in today, is he? No. If you were me and actually needed to talk to him, what would you do? What was his name and number? Probably. You sure that's okay? Sure. Hi, so-and-so. Listen, Bill at your office said you might be able to help me. I acted helpless, didn't I? I went a little bit not okay. A little bit Columbo. I'm a little confused. Maybe you can help me out. I think I'm lost here. <laughs> Only the people over 40 know who Columbo is. <laughs> we talk to non-decision makers because they're easier. They're non-threatening. Um, we're lazy. Salespeople are ambitiously lazy. You all know that, right? We got into sales because we wanted to make a lot of money and none of us wanted to work hard. That's why I got into sales. True? Um, they're nice to us. They'll never tell you no, but they're not allowed to say yes. So we have this ongoing relationship, ongoing conversations with people, and you tell your boss, I'm going out to make a sales call, and you're really a professional visitor. <laughs> Don't take a no from someone who can't say yes. 13.5. Oh, this is, a, this is a black belt one. You're not using a close the file move. This one's going to make you money. I'll leave you with this. You all have prospects. You've got proposals, people you've been working on for days, weeks, and months, right? How many of them, if you had to bet 500 bucks that you're going to close it, you wouldn't put the bet down? Okay, Those are the ones that are probably dead, but you know you just keep... You know, you know, come on, you know, hit him again, hit him again, right? <laughs> let's put the paddles on one more time and let's see if it's really dead. You've been chasing him for too long. Would you bet money that you'll close him? I don't think I put it in here, but I have a close the file email or letter that I use. And if it's up here, you'll see it in a second, but I'll give it to you. Dear Bill. It's been about a month and a half since we've talked. I've left you several messages. I haven't heard back. Normally when that happens, it's for one of three reasons. Number one, you really want to talk with me. This is important, but I haven't risen to the top of the pile yet. Is that a legitimate reason they haven't called back? We had a fire. Somebody died at the office. Yeah, there's, there's things that happen that are more important than them <coughs> signing the contract with you. Number two, you've already decided you're not going to go with us but you don't know how to tell me no. You don't know how to break the news to me, right? Number three, you desperately want to call me, 
but you're stuck under something heavy and you can't reach the phone. <laughs> and they laugh at that point. New paragraph, please let me know which one it is. If it's number one, I understand, let me know when we should talk and I'll reach out then. If it's number two, no's okay, let me know and I'll leave you alone. And if it's number three, email me back and I'll send help immediately. <laughs> Thanks in advance for your reply. It almost always gets a response. If there's no response, you know it's number two, right? <laughs> but the best one I ever got was number one and number three, call me Monday. <laughs> Use a little bit of humor. Humor works in sales. It's good to know when it's over. It's interesting. I've been going through a lot of different stuff in the last year. Um, and what happens is when a lot of things are going on in your life and your business, we have a limited amount of RAM, okay? used to be 32K and 64K, now it's four and five and eight gigs, right? But we have a limited amount of RAM. And when you've got a problem or something that is swirling around and you're spending a lot of waking and sleeping hours thinking about it, it eats up your RAM. When you clear it out, when the ones that aren't gonna close go away, it's like all of a sudden the sun breaks through the clouds and now you can see clearly and maybe you can be a little bit more productive. So. Think about the ones, in fact, there's the letter. The other thing that I'll do sometime on number three is you're being chased by an angry hippopotamus and you can't reach the phone. There's a copy of this, I believe, in the book, too. Um, and I'll actually put a picture of a guy from Africa literally being chased down the road by a hippo. Hippopotamuses kill far more people than, than rhinos in Africa. They're very, very territorial, and they're more, far more prevalent. But there, there's the letter for you, and that will make you money. Okay, a um, couple of minutes for questions. Anybody got any questions? If not, there's going to be a test. Yes, sir. Uh, I would like to better understand how uh, talking to non decision makers can help you with your business. Well, it can't. You have to stop talking to non decision makers. It's not talking to them. The, pro the problem is, is you're still talking to them because they're more comfortable. You have to make the uncomfortable calls. We tend to operate in a comfort zone. We do the things that are comfortable to us. You've got to step outside your comfort zone. And if somebody's not a decision maker, you don't want to say, well, you're not the decision maker. Ask them this question. Let me ask you this. This is a big decision for your company, true? Who other than you would need to be involved in this kind of a decision? And they tell you Mo, Curly, and Larry. Great. What role does Mo play? What does Curly do? Tell me about Larry. If Mo and Curly and Larry aren't in the room, are you going to get a decision on anything? Do you think they're going to have questions? Do you think maybe they should join our conversation? Well, Mo and Curly are not in town, but Larry's here. Well, why don't you invite Larry in and let's see, because if it doesn't make sense to the two of you, we don't need to waste Mo and Curly's line, uh, time, okay? Get them in the room. Other questions? Does that, did that answer your question? Yes. Do you see a, a trend towards salesmen doing less Sales work, more other work. Other work being? Christ lists, hard work, customer complaints. Well, that's, that's creative avoidance. What's the highest and best use? In real estate, it's location, 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 right? So what's the highest and best use for that piece of property, as Billy would know, right? In salespeople, what's the highest and best use of their time? I did this in my own business. I looked at my time. My time is best spent selling, doing presentations like this, and teaching. So I spend 95% of my time doing those three things. Okay, If they're doing proposals, if they're working on price lists, let me spend a little time on the marketing program. No, you can do the marketing program at five, from five to six o'clock when, when your clients aren't reachable. From, from, from noon to five, you're either with a client, trying to get with a client, in a situation where you could meet a client, or, you know, Emails can be done at 8 o'clock at night. You can set that up to be done automatically. Don't sit there for four hours in the afternoon and send out emails. They're, doing, they're, not, doing what, they're, not, doing, they're not spending their time as productively as they should. One, one more question? Okay, yes. Um, so do, do you advocate then separating account management from sales? Well, there's hunters and there's farmers. Okay, hunters bring in the fresh meat and farmers will cure it and skin it and you know, smoke it and do all that kind of stuff, right? And they'll till the fields where they are, but they don't go out in the woods. 
Um, some of us have to wear more than one hat. We have to close it and then also manage the account. You have to look at your business and say, what's the best for my model for my business? With some, it has to be the same person. With others, it can be some person, one person brings it in and they go out in the woods to go kill something else while the people internally make that person feel comfortable and the customer service or account management work. So <coughs> what industry are you in, Andrew? Uh, private tag agency. Private tag agency. Private tag agency. Um, and the clients you're dealing with are stuff car like dealers. car dealers. Um, they don't, you probably, uh, account management. Yeah, so right now our salespeople are account managers. We actually call them account managers. And so they probably spend 50% of their time uh, prospecting new clients and 50% of their time maintaining current clients. Do they have very large books of business? Uh, I wouldn't say very large. If you took your best salesperson and they no longer had to do account management, once a quarter they would stop in with the account manager to visit the client, how many more new accounts could that salesperson be landing if they weren't spending their time holding the hands on stuff with old clients? Many, um, but there is a, the, the kind of conversation that we had was that there is a benefit to only having to interact with one person. So the particular service that we provide, mm. a customer has to go and interact with several different companies. And so it already is a confusing process about who is. Let me, let me show you an easy way to do that. Back, back in the 80s, I owned the largest direct mail company in Orlando. And I had something called account <coughs> coordinators because I was doing 95% of the sales. I didn't have time to manage and be with Disney all the time and be with SunBank, with SunBank back then, and go to Barnett Bank. I, I was dealing with getting the sale closed, not getting the mailing out the door and doing all the coordination on the artwork and the pay postage money and all that kind of stuff. So I had a, I, four, four ladies, because I could never find a guy who could do the job properly, who were my account coordinators. And I would bring Lisa along with me, and I would say, look, I'm here for you. You can use me. you got my cell number. Um, but I, a lot of times, I am not in the office. I'm out. So if you have a question about what's going on with the project, you've got two choices. You can give me a call. If I'm in the office, I'll get right on it. If I'm not in the office, you can leave me a message. And as soon as I get to my phone, I'll give Lisa a call, and I'll find out what's going on. Or if it would be easier for you, you can call Lisa directly and she'll keep me informed. Whichever you would like, that's what we'll do. You know, I never got phone calls after that point. Lisa got all the phone calls. You empower somebody underneath you to do it and you stick your head back in. Is she taking good care of you? Anything I can do? Great. You're in good. You have to do a handoff. And car dealers can be a little tough to deal with um, because of their communication style. They're very direct. They're very bottom line. And then they just come at you with a hammer, not even a no velvet around it. So you have to understand that a high D communication style, outgoing task oriented, you have to become a high D to bond with them. You guys understand DISC? Bonding with a high D is let's fight, okay, now let's go have a beer. <laughs> they have to see you as an equal. A player will not engage with a non-player. If somebody, if you have a client who you, doesn't engage well with you, you've got to become a player. And once they see you as a player, then they'll talk to you. But talk, talk to me afterwards on that. All right? Any other questions? Good. I hand it back over to Jeff.